I think when you have a people-based business, if you don't understand how disproportionate culture is, I think you'll lose. And what I mean by losing is there's unbelievable amounts of businesses out there that are winning financially that don't have good culture. It's not good, it's anxious, it doesn't need to be toxic, it's just not great, it's like yeah. a job, it's like whatever. You know, for me, those companies are missing out on top line revenue and profit. I'm telling all of them, get everyone feeling safe, accountable, but happy place. I call it honey empire. Honey over vinegar, but we're trying to build an empire. So that's Gary Vee, head of VaynerX, the advertising holding agency, a YouTuber, you have a lot of things. Welcome to Decoder. Thanks for having me. Decoder is a show about structure and process and decision making, and you have the most of that from what <laughs> I can tell. You just have a lot going on. Let's start at the very beginning. How are your companies structured? How does that work? VaynerX that you yeah. just mentioned that a lot of people don't know about, you know, they they see the Gary Vee of it all, but yeah. they don't realize that there's an 15, 1600 person global company. VaynerX, the main company is VaynerMedia, the company I started in 2009 with my brother AJ. Um, that's the advertising agency, that's the Mad Men, mm -hmm. Madison Avenue thing. <laughs> we do media and creative together, which is a little bit of an innovation in, in today's marketing world, uh, which means we spend the media and make the content. Um, that probably, that has 1,200 or so of the employees, uh, New York, LA, Toronto, Mexico City, London, Amsterdam, um, Singapore, Australia, and a lot of other uh, uh, people in the APAC region. So that's that. And then the next biggest companies in VaynerX are the Gallery Media Group, which houses purewow.com and 1.37 p.m. So that's publishing, mm -hmm. similar to what Jimmy and all of you are doing. Uh, then there's the Sasha Group, named after my father. Um, that's a agency for SMBs. So we're getting so much inbound, especially given my career on like more mom and pop businesses, not yeah. the Pepsis and the, the Chase, wine, the exactly. So we wanted to create something of that that's been really fruitful. James Rossini runs that. There's Vayner3, which is an innovation strategy company, AI, uh, blockchain, VR, QR. Uh, that's more like a Bain and McKinsey company. Avery mm -hmm. runs that, that's going well. Vayner Speakers, a, a speaking bureau, Zach runs that. Um, then there's Eva Nosadam, which is Madison Ave, spelled backwards, Eva Nosadam Productions, which is a production company that makes our commercials. We do you know, a lot of Super Bowl, a lot of uh, different kind of commercials. The Jimmy John's, um, uh, Young Gravy ad recently, the Cheetos thing. We do Dwayne Wade a couple years ago when he retired for Budweiser, those kind of things. So that's the production company. So that's kind of like the, you know, a big ecosystem uh, of ours. There's Vayner Commerce, a commerce business. So that's that world. Then there's the moonlighting I do, helping out my dad with the original business, Wine <laughs> Library, talking to my best friend Brandon uh, Warnicky. So that's that world. So Wine Library and winetext.com. That's going super well, especially Wine Text. Get a text a day, reply, yeah. get discounted wine. Um, there's Vayner Sports. My brother AJ and Greg Gensky are the co-CEOs of that. AJ left halfway through the Vayner journey and wanted to do something he loved. That's become a very big business. We just announced the basketball division with Bay Frazier, who was Mello's right hand for all those years. Um, but we're very big in baseball. Bo Bichette, Justin Turner, many others. Football, Kirk Cousins, uh, Aiden Hutchinson, many others. Um, UFC, Stephen Militich, Corey Sandhagen, many others. So that's going super well. Then there's V Friends. I've always wanted to buy a intellectual property. So I used to think I was gonna buy the Flintstones or Gumby yeah. or the Smurfs. The NFT thing came. I'm like, wait a minute, this is a place to launch it. I launched Be Friends a couple years ago, so that's my intellectual property business grounded in blockchain, but also uh, expanded to the real world. And then there's a little tiny room these days, though it's been a big chapter of the last decade of the Gary Vee of it all, right? Yeah. You know, all my content. Um, I'm really not public speaking anymore. I am writing a new book, but it's taken me a little while with how busy I am. Um, and, uh, and all the content creation, the podcast. So that's historically been a business in itself, though when VFriends came up, it sucked all the energy out of the Gary V of it all, because I've got to really run that. So that's, um, then there's obviously my investing. I do a lot of angel investing, some through a fund with Phil Toronto and my brother AJ, uh, Vayner Fund, three. Um, and then there's boards I sit on, nonprofit and, and public and, or private. Um, so yeah, busy. So you mentioned VaynerX, 600 yes. people, that's the big holding company, yes. that's got the ad agency and a bunch of other stuff. Then you mentioned some companies that are not part of it. How do you decide what's in, what's out? What's in VaynerX, what's not in VaynerX? So the reality is is that I do, I do view 
you know, be friends and, and VaynerX as the two cores. But there are moments when AJ needs me on Vayner Sports. There's gonna be moments as Eric Wattenberg builds out our production company where I'm gonna have to fly to LA and pitch a show for a big opportunity on Netflix. You know, it's gonna happen. Um, so I decide based on two chiefs of staff and three admins whose full-time job is to take all the inbound that comes in my text and my Slack and my email uh, and strategize. We, we spend a lot of time you know, uh, during the week thinking about the three weeks ahead. We're always, you know, lots of 15 minute meetings instead of 30, trying to make a lot happen. And then you're in the, you're, it's almost like being in the news business. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like all of you. you, you have your editorial strategy, but then, you know, it's like in the sports media business, you have your strategy for today and then Aaron Rodgers gets traded to the Jets <laughs> officially and that's gonna change up. Yeah. And that's what being an operator at a high level, I think, with multiple things going on is, I have my strategy for this week, but anything can happen in the next hour that blows out three hours, and then those three hours have to get back in the books because those are top 5% things in a world of a million things being thrown at you, and so it's a constant flow. How much do you delegate? You, you said you had an five amount. people. Are they actually in your Slack? Your admins have like full Slack access to, to your scarier, DMs? Scarier than that. My yeah. admins have access to everything. Yeah. My iCloud, my email. I live a transparent life with my admins. <laughs> like, you know, they're in my, they're in, signed into all my social. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I keep it very transparent with them because I need to be able to navigate quickly and they need all the data points. So I, I delegate tremendously. Yeah. I don't think you really can. I, I would argue that for a lot of people listening or watching, all of their limitations and the growth of the things they're operating. Um, by the way, whether that's a family that you're operating and not delegating enough to the oldest child or to a friend or an aunt or a grandparent, or if you're running a business, or like me, many, many, many businesses, delegation, trust, uh, the lack of ego of thinking you do everything the best Mm -hmm. is an incredible thing that I most look at when I'm trying to help a friend, family member, or an investment to figure out why they're not scaling. When you think about delegation, there's the admins, then you've got companies, you've got people running your companies. How do you decide, okay, these are the people who are gonna be in charge of this company inside of VaynerX, and this company needs to be outside of VaynerX with a different leadership structure? Um, outside of VaynerX has been easy. Steve Ross, the owner of the Dolphins, is a business partner of ours and couldn't own a piece of the sports agency, so we spun that out. Sure. And then with Vayner, so Vayner Sports and Vayner Watt are the only things outside of the company. Vayner Watt, because Eric needed to be such a significant partner, it needed to sit out of the structure. Mm-hmm. But most things will go into VaynerX if they're in that service world. And the way I really decide that is pretty simple. Um, I either really know or I really don't know. And let me explain. Avery, who runs Vayner 3, um, or Jeannie, who runs Vayner Toronto, They were executives that were here three, four, five years Mm -hmm. doing great work that made me confident to send Avery to APAC or Jeannie to up to Toronto. Then there's guessing. You know, I made a subjective guess on Gabby who runs LATAM in Mexico City. I made a subjective guess on Daisy who'd been in for a couple months to take over EMEA, UK, Mm -hmm. Europe. And then in those scenarios, you go in optimistic you go in focused on trying to help them, and then in a 12, 18, 24, 36 month window, you're making a final decision if you made the right call. Are you telling them here are the metrics I'm judging you on, make the number go up? Not really, I'm really, yes, they can't go out of business, Yeah. but I'm a little, you know, I'm not publicly held company, I'm not looking to exit, so I, you know, I'd like them to be fiscally responsible, they can't be completely aloof, <laughs> but I would argue that what I most focus on is like, if you do not have the people that work for you, and I mean all of them, not your direct reports, incredibly happy with you, feeling safe, cold, I think when you have a people-based business, if you don't understand how disproportionate culture is, I think you'll lose, I really do. And what I mean by losing is, there's unbelievable amounts of businesses out there that are winning financially that don't have good culture. It's mm-hmm. not good, it's toxic, it's not good, it's anxious, it's, it doesn't even need to be toxic or that serious, it's just not great, it's like yeah. a job, it's like whatever. You know, for me, those companies are missing out on top line revenue and, mm-hmm. and profit. And so, you know, I think for me, I'm telling all of them, get everyone feeling safe, because there's so much fear in the world, and get everyone understanding how unique the marketing strategies we have are, or in VFriends, what we're actually up to, or whatever company it is, Vayner Sports, how well we are in marketing off the field. Get the 
the core messages down and understand them, but most importantly, build a safety, happy, accountable, but happy place. I call it honey empire. Honey over vinegar, but we're trying to build an empire. <laughs> it's, you know, this is not for fun. And so those are the, those are the metrics. And, and that is a struggle for people on the outside. Right. Everyone out here, these big buildings, is being trained to win on the PL, not on the culture. This is actually my next question. Please. Right? So you've got a big holding company, you've got lots of empowered executives. Yes. We talk a lot on the show about divisional structures versus functional structures. A lot of tech companies are functional, right? Tim Cook runs marketing and he runs product and it all rolls up to him. And at the end of the day, they somehow produce an iPhone. Other companies are divisional, right? You've got just a stack and you've got some redundant functions in them. How is, how is VaynerX structured? Is a, it? a little bit of a mix of the two. Yeah. You know, the reality is, is I do a lot of casting on leaders. Yeah. You know, the, the, what's interesting is we're a 13 year old company, VaynerMedia, VaynerX is even younger, that happened when I bought Pure Wow. We started building it six years ago. A lot of this has to do with, you know, HQ, the Vayner X of it all, has its leaders, but we keep that pretty thin and we give a lot of power to the leaders of divisions mm -hmm. and companies. But you are micromanaging and creating redundancy while you're, it's almost like a kid riding a bike. Yeah. You've gotta give them training wheels, especially if they're from the outside. When I bring in new leaders from the outside, I'm gonna create some cushions. J you know, just because the reality is, is we do it very differently, both the craft and the culture. And so once someone is able to like cross over the hill, then I think we can make it, you know, far more autonomy based. Mm -hmm. But we like, I like to be close to uh, people that have enormous amounts of control, though I have no interest in micromanaging them. Yeah. So I'm in the business of bad phone. I'm in the business of making them feel safe. Ba Did you say bad phone? Bad phone. So there's a crisis you had to call Gary? Even more, I'm just- a special bad phone? No, <laughs> everyone has the same number, but yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's funny. It's not, yes, crisis. It's more like, just keep, like, keep me close, use yeah. me. You know, so many of these leaders, actually, ironically, we had a global offsite yesterday. Um, so many of them want to prove to me they can do it. And I keep telling them, hey, I know you can do it. The problem is, you've been doing it for 20 years on the outside, there's 7,300 nuances here. Text me and ask. Yeah. Like, I'm not judging you, I'm here to help you, I work for you. But outside executives struggle with that. Yeah. They don't believe me. And yeah. it sometimes takes three to five years for me to break through of like, I'm not kidding. Like, <laughs> I'm not, you're not gonna get fired by missing your numbers, but you definitely become vulnerable if people aren't happy. And the quickest way for people to not be happy is for you to be scared of me yeah. and it, which then trickles down. Do people use your name to get what they want? I feel like at a company that's called VaynerX, run by Gary Vaynerchuk. You mean Gary, executives with each, yeah, with each other? Yeah, wants this. Does that happen I'm a lot? sure. Yeah. I'm sure that's happening. The the cool thing is, as a 13-year company, we have almost 100 people that have been here for nine years or longer. Mm -hmm. We have crazy retention. And I think what's awesome about that, when I hear this, I would say six, seven years ago, probably a lot more than today, there's too many people entrenched in too many places that know the truth of it all, that it's almost like been, it's almost like a double negative. Like, like <laughs> there's, there's so many family members in so many different places that I think it doesn't, it's harder to get away with that, but I'm sure that happens every day. Yeah, I'm That's always scale. just curious, That's especially scale. when your name is on the door. What's cool is I have such an aggressive open door policy that ironically, the junior people use me more than the senior people at times. And so a lot of people are comfortable, even like a year in, only meeting with me once, but based on everything that they know, to email me and be like, hey, my boss's boss boss said this, is this true? And I'm like, <laughs> no, or yes. Like, you know, it's it's, I couldn't encourage leaders that are listening here more on finding as many five and 10 minute slots to say hello to a new employee. Like just that breaking the ice of it all is massive. Yeah. This brings me to, I think, the decoder question you're describing, right? This process you have where you, you make big long-term strategy, you have a vision, and then you're very reactive to things that are happening to you, incoming information all along. How do you make decisions? So I'll answer that and I love how you put that. I literally operate on macro patience mm -hmm. and micro speed. Mm -hmm. I make decisions based on a lot of things. One, um, my intuition. I really do believe that, I think a lot about what do we know today that people didn't know 100 years ago? A ton, a ton about the body, yeah. the mind. I always ask myself, what are people gonna know 100 years from now that we don't know today? My favorite 
running thesis right now is that we don't talk enough about the gut, Mm -hmm. the intuition, the operating system that this is. We know this is, Mm -hmm. but we don't talk enough about this. And so my big guess in 100 years is this is understood a lot more and is like a normal part of life. Intuition, you mean? That's right. Not your microbiome. Both, by the way, okay. ironically. Yeah. It's All funny, right. I was about to say that, but that's exactly right. Both, actually. How much of an impact on your life this is. Mm-hmm. So, intuition is very big. Pattern recognition is enormous. For the 23-year-olds, harder. For everybody who's 45 and older, massive. Experience matters. These gray hairs start to add up, <laughs> right? They, they do have value. And so, pattern recognition. Number three, a complete, utter focus on intent and lack of fear. Mm-hmm. Every decision I make, I know has good intent. Truly, thus rendering me very confident that if there's ramifications or I made a misstep, that the apology is always there, that the correction is there, the vulnerability, the humility. I'm not scared of making a wrong call. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge part of my decisions. And then tons of data. The reason I want the bat phone, which is really more just check in and let's keep talking, is I can make fast decisions when I'm sitting on a lot of information. Yeah. And so I'm talking to all my employees all the time, virtually, through text, or in person, mainly to make me have the ability to go fast in the future. One of my biggest beliefs is that most CEOs don't spend enough time judging the judgers. Mm -hmm. I am judging my 40, 50 most senior people on how much I value their word blindly, like Marcus and Hannah, my chiefs of staff who I'm looking at across the window right now because they've been here for nine and 13 years, Mm -hmm. or less but a road to it for an executive that's maybe running a company or an office that's only been here for two or three years. I can't be blindly with them yet. I don't have enough data, but that's the framework I work in. So I'm just talking to you. Uh, here in person, you're very animated, you're very charming, you're very direct. I have discovered that when I'm very direct in digital communication, I come off like a huge jerk. How do you do all the things you do and communicate digitally with your team? I don't communicate digitally. You don't, you don't, you're not slacking, you're not. I, I do, but I'm petrified of it. I tell everyone, if it's something real, get out of text. Yeah. The misinterpretation of the written word digitally is a monster. Yeah, B- People will consume it based on their framework. Or when I do it and I have to give any level of direct, I'm coming with a heart emoji and a sun <laughs> right behind it. I do that a lot. And I do that a lot because I'm petrified that someone's losing the tone. Yeah, We had a, Cole just joined our team. He just joined our WhatsApp where my team works on our content. He doesn't know me. Yeah, And if I've got something to say right now, he might think on his first day, like, wait a minute, Gary's actually full of shit. He's not as nice. Like, I need to put that heart emoji. I think people need to, uh, the voice memo, so they can hear my voice. Um, I'm petrified to deliver even neutral to slightly canderous feedback in just written word. I think it's a massive mistake. I have completely gotten my leadership team off of the long email that's talking about, like, today we've had to, like, I mean, I'm like, it's crazy. You're scaring people. So... You know, you know. Again, if it's with Sid, who I've been with for eight or nine years, I can do anything. He knows it's co- <laughs> meaning he in written form because he knows it's coming yeah. from a good place. But back to your point, when I'm being direct, which is by the way, ironically, Gary V in interviews, my content great at candor. Gary Vaynerchuk, the executive, has struggled historically with candor. Yeah, I hate negativity. I hate. I've always seen candor as something that would scare people. I had it misunderstood for the majority of my career. So I call it kind candor. You need to, del- if you're delivering candor, you need to be empathetic that the other person on the other side is not gonna feel great. Yeah. Even if it's like truly fair, they're still gonna feel bad about themselves. So why not have compassion and try to make them feel a little bit better by referencing something you've struggled with mm-hmm. or just fixing the tone. So I think about that a lot. Yeah, I always think about it in terms of you can tell people it's okay to feel bad and then you can work through it together. But that first step is really hard. Yeah, or you could really put it on yourself as a leader and try to make them feel less bad. Yeah. Like there's absolutely a way to make someone feel slightly less bad when you're telling them that they're not good at their job. Let me talk about Gary Vee with you. You brought up this other character, Gary Vee versus Gary Vaynerchuk, the executive. Yep. The business of Gary Vee yes. seems as complicated as chaotic as anything, and it exists on social platforms, yes. forever changing. Yes. We were talking to your team just before you sat down about just how much video of you is logged every single day. Yes. And what an enormous operation is. Is Gary Vee, that's a character you're playing? No. No. Oh, it's, it's me, fully. Um, 
It's just the context of the room is different. Right now I know that we have a long form video and audio execution and I do believe that being slightly entertained or engaged and this was something I did subconsciously when I first started speaking. I didn't, it just, I have intuitive understanding mm-hmm. that you're more likely to get your message across if people actually pay attention. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. Right? So, no, I don't, there's nothing that I've ever put out on the internet that is shtick or fake. Yeah. Um, it's just that the context is different. If I'm having a company offsite that's trying to navigate a $350 million a year business, you can imagine with 15 people, that's gonna be a very different tone and tenor yesterday than me doing a podcast on one of, one of my favorite media platforms out there. Yeah. Like I'm just gonna be more excited. I know that somebody's running on the treadmill right now, walking their dog, driving in their car, <laughs> and I want them to continue to hear the words. And if it's like super serious and mundane, that might not be the energy you're looking for. I'm also aware that my energy might be too much for yeah. someone, this is like too hyper, and that's okay. This is just what naturally happens to me when there's cameras going. And so, no, it's not character life. It's just a slightly more animated version of myself, yeah. given that I get more excited when I think there's more people involved. But when you have this many people falling around with cameras, yeah. logging everything you say, yes. ingesting it into what sounds like a very impressive Airtable system. Thank I'm you. very jealous Thank of it. You. You're a reality show, right? I mean, like you're yeah, kind think- of producing a daily reality show, and that naturally has to heighten whatever loudest characteristics you have. I don't know about that, I'll I'll explain. If you look, I would argue that YouTube is the platform that I do least well. Yeah. Mainly because I'm not overly passionate from a reality TV show standpoint, meaning I'm not trying to rate. Mm -hmm. I don't want the vlog to be overly successful from like winning an Emmy or getting a lot of viewers. I'd be fine with it. I'm trying to document way more than I'm trying to entertain. Yeah. Um, a big part of the vlog was done because I lost both my grandfathers before I got to know them and I thought it would be neat that one day in 60, 70 years this would exist. I also knew that it would bring awareness and demand, mm-hmm. but I really wanted it as a blueprint for people to see like, this entrepreneur thing is not so fun. Like it's not as easy as, it's not cool as it's mm-hmm. become. And so, yeah, no, I don't, you know, there's, for example, there's nothing that I do day to day that has anything to do with the vlog. Yeah. It's just a documenting framework. Well, I gotta ask you, do you ever turn it off? Yeah, right. a lot. A lot. What's, what's quiet Vaynerchuk like? The weekends, the, yeah. the, the On holidays. The weekends, you're out there like flipping Beanie Babies, man. Very, you know, I think what I've done really well is, back to them following me around, mm-hmm. is I've garage sailed three times in the last three years. Yeah. I'm just very good at content creation, of maximizing what I do. So, no, I mean, on the weekends, I'm spending time with my family. Uh, I'm decompressing. Um, quiet me is still hyped. Like, I'm an excited, <laughs> you know, like, I'm excited. I'm happy. I'm, I'm incredibly motivated and grateful for having a life. I think that people take for granted. I, uh, I'm on the board of uh, Charity Water. Yeah. 850 million people on Earth, more than 10%, don't have access to clean water. I find it very hard to not be excited about life yeah. when we live in a first world country where both my parents are alive, where I have great siblings and a family. Like, I'm very fortunate. And so gratitude is a huge, like I think people have envy and jealousy and dwelling and complaining DNA and that's a drainer. Mm-hmm. But when you're grateful and optimistic, you're kind of just excited for like, like I'm pumped when a weekend is this sunny. I actually noticed today when I was working out that it was really sunny and then my brain said, I hope this weekend's gonna be nice. Yeah. Like I'm grateful for very simple shit which makes me excited and calm. When you think about the image you put out into the universe, I watch your TikToks, I love your TikToks. You're always Thank talking you. to an audience. Yes. Right, it always seems like you're addressing some room. Yes. That's the majority of your content. Your audience does not see that you're just walking on the treadmill and you're happy that it's sunny yeah. outside or that you're yeah. quiet with your family. You have a very particular kind of image. Do you worry that you're leading people to believe that you're always on and that they should themselves always be on? No, I don't worry about that at all. I think, for example, I think people find what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. like, I've been very aggressive of like, I don't wanna share my personal life. I have tons of challenges. I speak about vulnerabilities. I am a public figure. People know about my stuff. Like. Yeah. No, I really don't. I, I understand the question. Yeah. I think that it's time that we have a more thoughtful conversation around this. Meaning, I as a human, when I consume content at scale, never believe 
that any of the people that I'm consuming are showing you every single thing of their life, nor do I believe it's as good or as bad. Or yeah. as, I, I think that's a very um, lazy intellectual point of view. And so, so you have that point of view because you, you grew up with it. I mean, I, like, I, grew, I grew up with the internet. I grew up with well, bloggers I and YouTubers, but, but Go ahead. It, it grew up with you. Right, it didn't exist and it slowly has gotten to where it is now and you've seen that whole transition. I think about our young audience, they're fish and they don't know about the water, right? They just grew up in a world where influencers exist, in a world where YouTubers exist, where being a YouTube star is a career path that you can tell your parents when you're five years old, right? And so you had this view where like, this isn't all real and you're making the reality show, all of us are making the reality show and you have an audience that doesn't know that it's a show. Well, I, I think you. I think the way you framed it up is a little awkward. Let me okay. explain. I think everything I show is real. Yeah. It's just not the complete part of my life, and there's certain things I decide not to share. Yeah. You know, I think. I also think when I think about this, when I was a kid, pre-internet, we we looked up to stuff too. You know, my big question is, where's parenting in 2023? Yeah. <laughs> like, like I, I think that. Yeah, you, but you are that figure for a lot of for a lot of people, young men in particular. You are that figure. Yeah, but I, you know, that is such an extraordinarily deep challenge, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, when I think of being someone that someone may look up to, I'm humbled by that, and so much of the way I create content understands that to be true. Mm -hmm. But I could never comprehend you know, the, the complexity of actually being someone's parent yeah. or, you know, someone loses a parent and who, who replicates or fills that void. You look at that kind of from a human journey and there's many inputs that fill that void. Yeah. I, I think that's right. I do think that there's incredible um, intrigue that I have about the sheer volume of people that are putting out information in the world. But I feel like that has always been the game. Like, there's an entire generation of boomers who live their life like Mickey Mantle because he was the one that they looked up to. So it's always existed. What I'm actually optimistic about is there's way more ways to look at things today. Yeah. And I think how people choose their paths is interesting. You talked a lot about being adaptable and experience. <laughs> there's a tension there, right? Uh, you in particular are very good at using your experience to adapt to new platforms in particular yes. from YouTube to Instagram to TikTok to NFTs, if that pans out. Yep. How do you think about that tension? All right, we gotta, we're doing well on YouTube, but I gotta take everything I know and go find a new audience on TikTok. Cause you talk, this is something you talk about a lot. Like a lot. you gotta jump when the time's right. You gotta jump when the time's right if that's your ambition. Mm -hmm. You know, back to your point, which I thought was really great in the last series of questions. One of the things I talk a lot about, back to people hearing what mm -hmm. they want to hear, is you need to be self-aware over everything and understand the journey you're on. So if you're a business and you want to grow your business, you have to go where the consumer attention is. Mm -hmm. That's just a requirement. So the way I think about it is, I am on my journey to try to build as much awareness as possible for the things that I'm passionate about. That requires me to, I'm not thrilled if tomorrow Black Jacket becomes a hot platform, mm -hmm but I have no choice but to take it seriously because this is, you know, for me, I enjoy my craft. I yeah. enjoy my job and I want to do that. On the flip side, I'm very empathetic and talk a lot to the audience of like, hey, you, this happened huge three, four years ago. I'm like, TikTok, 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 TikTok. And everyone's like, dude, I'm just getting Instagram gown. And I'm like, cool, you're more than welcome to not do it. You have to understand the attention's gonna move there and yeah. you need to understand where you are on your journey. You can't be ideological about where you want the consumer attention is. You need to be where the consumer attention is. Yeah, I guess the reason I ask you that is that constant change, that platform churn. I'm looking at the state of social media today. I'm looking at a bunch of YouTubers who are worried about growing out culture and they talk about it openly. I'm worried about a bunch of TikTokers who seem like they rose with the platform, got burned out, and they've kind of receded. Yeah. Right. That first wave of really big TikTokers, they've kind of pulled back. But that's good, isn't it? I, I wonder. I, I It feels like being the most famous person on YouTube is no longer a great business. Well, it, that, was, that it, was, goal, it, it was never a great business being the most famous person. I mean, think about what we're dealing with. We, you and I grew up in an era where we knew that child stars, mm -hmm. it was tough. Yeah. And so a lot of these kids get so much fame and money at such a young age, it's really hard 
to calibrate that. Wait, so you're coming at this from like a marketing perspective. That, that, when you yes. talk about attention moving, yes. right? What I hear is, okay, this is a great marketer yes. who's saying, okay, I got to go send a message and we got to move to the platform, be native to yes. the platform. There is a generation of entrepreneurs who are like, this is my business. My business is making content. You know a bunch of them. You, you, you mean a human? Of course, of, of course. Uh, and you go between those worlds, right? Yes. Gary Vee is a brand that makes content. That's yes. a business. I'm sure it's monetized. Yeah. If you're the world's best TikToker and you reach the peak, you're not making as much money as if you turn around and launch a merch line and stop making TikToks. That's and that right. pattern to me seems really... It seems like the, the, we're at the end of the road. Like everyone's realized the centralized social platforms are not stable foundations to build businesses. Meaning if you're just monetizing as an influencer? Yeah, if you're monetizing well, as an influencer kind of, or even I, if, if, if they're your core marketing platform. Well, that would be like saying si at running commercials on Seinfeld is not sustainable. No shit. Yeah. Like once it's not got the attention, you have to move on. Yeah. So like as core marketing, I think it's crazy to not extract awareness from where it's actually being consumed. Fair enough. So that's that. To your point on the human element, that's a whole different game. That comes down to parenting and DNA. Right. Right. Like when I met the D'Amelios, I was like, oh, these girls are extremely fortunate. This is like a real dad and mom. Yeah. It's like my Vayner sports business. You know, do you know how many athletes grow up with nothing and then sign big contracts? And the ones that have self-awareness and stability do incredibly well with their money and their life and the ones that don't become quite vulnerable. To your point, when you're a business, it's easier to move ebb and flow. When you're a human, there's going to be a natural time where you can't deal with the negative comments, the workload. Mm -hmm. But I view that more like the way we looked at like the Madonnas and Michael Jacksons and all those people in the 80s, which is I think you'll see them ebb and flow. It was funny, I was listening to a Bruno Mars song this morning and like it was just in rotation on my Alexa and I was like, where is Bruno Mars? Like <laughs> he right now, and I was thinking, I'm like, oh, he's probably like chilling right now and like decompressing from yeah. world tour and all that fame. We've seen every single famous person over the last 40, 50 years. It's impossible to stay white hot forever because you're a human and you need to take a break. Yeah. I mean, I did five years of a wine show every day from 2006 to 2011 and was like really out and about and going. And then in 2011, from 2011 to 14, I made very little content building the foundation of this business. A, because this business was an opportunity, but B, because I was like, eh, I don't wanna make wine content every day. Yeah. My daily vlog, I did it every day for three, four years, filmed everything. The team will tell you right now with their head nods, we've been getting back into it. I don't wanna film half the stuff because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm out of rotation. Yeah. I'm like in this place and I think every human should be comfortable when they wanna go for it, when they don't, similar to working out. Yeah. I'm sure in your 42, you said, yeah. you've had moments where you've been better or worse about eating and exercise habits. I think the same thing for an influencer. Like They're gonna be hot at certain times, they're not gonna be hot. And what I mean by that is they themselves, they're gonna be into it at times, they're not gonna be into it at times. And I think the, the influencer business, yeah. I think is incredibly sustainable. I just don't think it's sustainable for every person, every minute. And to your point, some of them have other entrepreneurial capabilities. That seems like the path out, right? It seems like once you once you find your way out to prime, right, or whatever. Yeah, but how many people are going to be able to be Emma Chamberlain, Logan Paul, and you know, and Mr. Beast? Yeah. Right. Like, there's a lot of brands that have been started by a lot of people. Like, you know, when I did Empathy Wines years ago as a DTC brand. I knew that I could do it because I was an operator. A lot of these people are not actual operators or won't find a partner operator that's good. Yeah. And so I, I think that it's a and conversation, not an or. Mm -hmm. I think there'll be plenty of people that will continue to be a personal brand in perpetuity, just like there are celebrities who get paid to be celebrities in perpetuity. To your point, some of those celebrities, Jessica Alba, some of those celebrities, Reese Witherspoon, Ashton Kutcher, had DNA, Ryan Reynolds, Kevin Hart, The Rock. So I think it's going to be and for some people, but I do think the long tail of influencer is a sustainable business model, but to your point, I don't think every human, nor most humans, can do it forever. They'll ebb and flow and ebb and flow. Yeah. Do you think that it's harder because the platform has changed so much? I think right. it's we, easier. You think it's easier to okay. go? Well, to, what did we do? If you're ebbing and flowing in in one of your in middle of your down period, everyone's attention moves from well, YouTube what if, to what if YouTube you, shorts. What about and, when you ebbed and flow as John Travolta and then people decided they didn't want to give you a chance again? He was out of the game for 15 years. But I mean, his business was selling acting services, right? If you're an influencer and you're making branded integrations with your YouTube videos, 
and suddenly that market disappears because all the attention's on TikTok. But it the does. The core of your business. But, but you know, you're speaking to a world that I don't think exists. Okay. Let's talk it through. Yeah, no, I think it's great. Yeah. Let's talk about it. In the last, what are we in 2023? In the last 17 years, mm-hmm. how many of the biggest platforms have disappeared off the face of the earth? Vine, which was only nine months old. Yeah. Right? Dear sweet one. I know, it was so fun. A lot of these people came from that. That really, actually, if you look at Vine, I think Vine will be historically looked at very interestingly because it's what started short form video at that level. But if you really look at the last 17 years, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, right? Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. It's not like they've disappeared. One of them seems like it might be disappearing in front of our eyes. TikTok? Twitter. TikTok might be a whole other thing. Well, I think TikTok, you know, I've been, you know, Twitter, if I'm reading the tea leaves and I have no inside info or any curiosity, but if you look at this whole X and like, like it looks like what Elon is signaling is he wants to build an app that's more similar to WeChat in China, which is full stack. Yeah. I'm really curious what that all means, but I don't think it's going away. It seems like it's about to be potentially part of something bigger. Yeah, but it seems like the users are like thinking about what, what's next, right? Like the, they're the business. Either way, it's we, you're correct. We've rarely seen platforms disappear. I think what we you have see- seen them lose relevance, right? And in particular, I think the mid-form YouTube video, the vlog, is like it used to be the gold standard. It's what everyone wanted to build, and now everyone wants to build TikToks and stuff. So I think, look, it's so funny you say that because I actually have a slightly different take. It's been crazy to me how many people are fired up that they're going from TikTok to YouTube Shorts and using YouTube Shorts to get two million subscribers Mm -hmm. to their longer form YouTube. Literally, my conversation with the TikTok emerging influencer is their excitement to go long form on YouTube because YouTube Shorts has given them the subscribers they've always wanted because so many of them actually wanted to be YouTube stars, but it was easier to grow on TikTok. So I think, look, it's different for every person to the last 10 minutes of this combo, but I don't, you know, I think the old media landscape was much harder to navigate because you had to be chosen by humans subjectively. And now with these platforms, they're empty pipes, and you as a human decide if you want to enter, if you want to be good at it, if you don't, ebb and flow, in and out. And I think that um, I think that's good as long as the human is self-aware and doing the right things by themselves. How do you bring this all to your, to your clients? Again, we're sitting at VaynerX, yeah. the biggest company is VaynerMedia, it's the ad agency. Yes. A lot of the clients now, it, the internet is not a, foreign concept right. and platforms are not right. a forereign concept. When you started, it was, right? Yes. This is a very new pitch that you're yes. making. Now there are other great ad agencies that are native to the, the space. What's your pitch? How do you go and, and make business? Our point of view is that we're the best at today. Mm-hmm. We think the industry cares about yesterday. Mm-hmm. Way too much television commercials, programmatic banners, all the kind of old world. We think they're also too bullish on tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, Even though I was very bullish and continue to be on NFTs, the macro, we had clients who wanted to build million dollar metaverses last year and I was like, are you out of your mind? There's like four people in the metaverse. Yeah. So they get excited about tomorrow. They're way too religious about yesterday and our pitch is like, we're the best of today. We do the media buying and the creative, the strategy behind that creative for the 10 platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, da 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 da, Pinterest. And when we get the consumer insights out of that creative, the quant and qual data, the numbers and the comments, it allows us to have a better brief, I'm pointing to that because usually it's about that long, of a brief, to then make the longer form videos that are modern day commercials. We want to make the commercials that are going to be strong on Hulu, connected TV, fast channels, and so that's our pitch. We're an ad agency that just thinks that television ads are overpriced and bad (laughs) digital is overpriced and you should do today's best and social happens to be that now. But if I started VaynerMedia in 1997, it would have been email and and then in 2000, we would have gone into search. And in 2041, we may be completely out of social because maybe the attention is on VR or metaverse. I'm very agnostic. I'm not overly passionate where the attention is. Uh, back to the TikTok thing. Yeah. Gary, what happens if TikTok's banned? I'm like, we'll go where the, co-. like, I have no emotion towards Twitter or TikTok or Facebook or Instagram. What I do have emotion to, what you mentioned earlier is, as long as I'm, acting in my professional life. I understand that attention matters. I'd like to understand where the best price is to get that attention. And I'd like to be good at bringing value with the videos, words, and 
content because I know that that always will work for the business if they're yeah. providing value. Let me ask you one question yeah. about attention and then I want to end with NFTs. Yeah. You talk about attention like a commodity, like you can price it and sell it. Yes. It's pretty ruthless actually. Like in a, just a, from a business sense, you're talking about like you're trading oil or gold or something. Yeah. I am a news person. Yes. I think about attention in a very different way. Yes. I watched one of your TikToks the other day. You were telling people how to make great content. And you're yes. like, if you got a thought, just Google it, find an article, green screen yourself in front yes. of the article. This is how you can capture attention on TikTok. And I thought, one, that's brilliant. And I told our team to start doing that with articles. Yeah. And then two, I thought, this is the scariest shit I ever heard. Because now we're trading on tr other people's trust, trust that there's a news article, but we're just doing it to harvest attention. Well, right? that's what and the, that ruthless side of it where we're just yeah, harvesting I, attention, I feel like yeah. there's a danger there. Well, I think that's what the news does. Like, I think humans are just acting like, to your point, most of the news that I consume on Fox, Decoder, CNN, and any other place. It's good, you got me up there. I got you, brother. <laughs> Listen, I think Jim, you know, well, just no. full disclosure, I don't know if I should disclose this, like, um, like I admire Jimmy's yeah. journey on building this media company, so, yes. Yeah. I'm so pumped for all the stuff you're doing. The very, so much good stuff. Um, but that's what it does, right? Like, like when Adam Schefter reports something, CBS says Adam Schefter report. You know, yeah, like yeah. I actually think what humans are doing with green screen, which was a creative strategy of the moment. Do you feel like you have a responsibility to use the attention you harness positively, constructively? Because if you're way. pretty ruthless, there there are other people who don't feel that way. Right, who are just after it for traffic, who are just after it for clicks, who are just after it for attention. Yeah. And at, you're right on the precipice where you talk about it like a commodity, but I know you, and I know you feel yeah. that responsibility. What is that responsibility for you? I want to be historically correct. I want to feel good when I put my head on the pillow. I want to talk about the things I'm passionate about. Yeah. I don't, I don't need to make my money, uh, you know, I don't monetize that attention directly the way media does. I monetize that from awareness if people are interested in the things that I do and then there's secondary realities of like here's a book or people come and see me speak thus rendering my speaking fee high or I make a wine and I'm like hey I think this is a better $20 wine and that attention gives me the opportunity to ask for an opportunity. So no I, I, I do think attention is the most important commodity in the world. I don't think of it like <laughs> I bought it for a dollar and sold it for a dollar yeah. too. I think of it as like, when you have your children before they're 18, that attention is everything in the framing of how they're gonna live their life. And you better take advantage of the attention. When you're a business person, if you can get attention, you get a chance to tell people about your products and services. It doesn't mean they're gonna buy it. I actually think one of the biggest issues of people who go patient with attention is they expect people to buy stuff from them after they've done a good job by getting the attention in a good way. Yeah. And I always tell them, you're not entitled to them buying anything. You're entitled to getting a chance for them to know about it. So, that's how I think about it. Let's end with VFriends. Mm -hmm. VFriends is maybe the ultimate example of you have a lot of attention on yourself. Yes. And you sold a product to consumers. Yes. In a way that, apart from the wine, I don't think you've sold a lot of products Correct. Those to are the consumers. two moves. It's, Sneakers a little bit, books a little bit. And I hear you on, you wanted, you've always wanted to have IP, so yes. you, you found a technological opening to create a uh, yes. franchise. NFTs were pretty weird in that moment, right? They were pretty bubbly. They were, they, people were buying them way too high. Yes. The market has crashed. Yes. Do you have any regrets about that whole situation? Not really, um, because, I mean, micro regret, you know, like, mm -hmm. like I, I made a ton of videos of 99% of these NFTs are going to zero. Yeah. And I made a ton of that at the height. So that's why I'm able to answer not really, because I was talking about it in a very macro way. The other thing was it was important for me to make my NFTs be a part of something that was physical. So VFriends Series 1 came with three tickets to a super business conference called VCon that the price of the mint was worth the conference in itself. Yeah. So, and then Series 2 came with trading cards that have created a lot of demand on eBay and things of that nature. So I feel macro good. Of course, there's a million things you want to do a little bit better of getting overexcited during moments along the way. Mm -hmm. But... I'm really glad, back to like, do I feel a responsibility on making content? Yeah. I, in, you know, in, when VFriends came out, one, in May of 21, it was a very young market, it kind of, and then things went bananas. Right. So in August and September and, Dece and October of that year, I started changing my content to, hey, this is something you need to learn about, to, hey, 99% of these are going to zero. Like, to your point, where NFTs are in the macro, 
pricing, not the technology, the products, that, the, yeah. the beanie babies of it all. Not stuffed animals are gonna be here for 100 years, the beanie babies and the garbage pail kids of it mm-hmm. all, right? People come up to me like, what do you, what? I'm like, look, like, this was always about the macro technology and there was unlimited content of 99% are going to zero, but people will hear what they want during that time when I was well, like- because they're paying you money for a thing, right? Well, but, th- but that was long, you have to say, they paid money for a thing in May. Right. Which again, came with physical items and the NFT was, was the that, attic. So, that's a reframing, right? So now the value is the physical items, the value. It wasn't a reframing. Okay. If you go watch all the, like, it really wasn't. It was, there's a collectible. I will spend 50 years trying to build this IP. Let's see what happens if I'm capable. Yeah. Comma, here is the conference yeah. that comes with it and this is how it's priced. So, you know, the good news is like, one great thing about documenting everything and doing yeah. this all the time is it's there. Yeah. It's there. I also have the benefit of like genuinely believing that I'm gonna make people fall in love with Optimistic Otter yeah. and Patient Panda and that becomes a Marvel and Pokemon journey over the next two decades. And this goes, you know, you really touched on something so important for me. What's the person's intent? Mm-hmm. You know, you said, do you have a responsibility in your content? Yes, that's why I put out what I put out. Um, do I have a responsibility to make this a big thing? I sure do. A lot of people want to believe that I'm gonna be able to pull it off and I believe I'm gonna be able to pull it off. So I think the intent and then the actions, cause you can't just have intent, is gonna become what everyone is judged on and I take that stuff serious. What do you think the timeline uh, for vFriends and then to use your word macro for NFTs is to become serious, to become meaningful? Well, I mean, series one is meaningful now. It's dramatically above, even with an 80%, 90% decline, massively above what people paid for it. but to your point, 10, 12, eight, you know, I think a lot about- Years. Yeah. Um, it's just gonna take time. Like, to get millions of people to care about, you know, Rare Robot, and you know, I've got a, I'm, you know, I started a TV production company to do animation. Mm-hmm. I signed a kid's book deal. We're, you know, we've done toys already with Macy's and Toys R Us. Like, it's just a lot of work, right? It takes time. Um, you know, but, you know, I think what's cool about NFTs is when you bring utility in the smart contract, that was always what gave me peace of mind. To your point, empathy, selling wine, peace of mind. When you're selling $40 wine for 20 bucks, yeah. people are gonna like it. V Friends, what gave me peace of mind was the collectible cards, the access, and then the super conference. And then the, the access that comes along the way, like different mini events, Burn Island, all these, you know, I'm working on it every day. So, um, you know, meaningful comes in a lot of different ways. For a far majority of the audience, it's already been ROI meaningful and now the collectible sits there as a added value. For others, to your point, that maybe bought it at higher prices when all the hype, I still got a lot of work for them probably to be fulfilled because they didn't buy at the mint price. Yeah. And so, you know, that's something I need to work on forever. I guess I'm at meaningful in the sense that it's an NFT, but NFTs are the technology that enabled you to introduce the IP. You mean the macro NFT? Got it. Right, but the idea that we're out there buying and selling NFT collectibles is not a mainstream idea, right? It was a no. very bubbly idea, but it's far from mainstream. When do you think it goes mainstream? 10 to 12. I think that's, 12. yeah, I think, I, because they're gonna be about utilities. It's more like, mm-hmm. you know, one of the analogies I used all the time was ticket stubs. Yeah. Like you go on eBay right now, you will hit the ground. Every fish concert, every sporting event, like just unlimited ticket stubs. Similar with NFTs, I think all tickets to Madison Square Garden over there in a decade are gonna be NFTs. And then if the LeBron of that day, Victor, the kid that's coming from France, if he drops 100 points in that game, well that becomes a collective. Like to me, nothing changes the way people collect. Like the reason I thought 99% would go to zero is because 99% of sports cards are zero. 99% of comic books are zero. The 1%, yeah. Get real interesting. Jordan rookie, Spider-Man number one. Um, so I think 10 years, I think VR, I, you know what's interesting? AI is gonna speed up a lot of the Web3 movement. Mm-hmm. Because I think, it, you know, right now, back to like uh, using other people's IP, green screen, I think that's more of like a media function of the way reporting works. But I think what's happening with AI creative and information, what's the source? And a lot of big companies are starting to think about litigation to these AI companies. But I think the blockchain proving provenance of source Mm -hmm. has a, you know, I haven't fully, you know, I'm in the lab on thinking about this. I don't like saying that loud because I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I tend to like to talk when I fully know. But there's something that 
feels yeah. right there. It'll be interesting how it works. Yeah. We are giving us way more time than anticipated. Thank you so much. Thanks for having Talk me. Soon. Talk soon.